All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've had a, this is a great conference. It's my first time in person, and I loved it. It's also the first time I win an award before presenting the paper. So, <laughs> and, uh, and my discussant, he made my co-authors before I did, so they were really freaking out and asking what was happening. Um, so this is a, um, a great day of discussion, and I very much um, look forward to uh, to, your, uh, to our discussion and to, uh, and to uh, further comments. So this is joint work with my two colleagues, Xavier and Shrelin from the finance group at Columbia. I'm in the accounting group at Columbia Business School and Yifani, who's a PhD student in uh, South Carolina. So in this paper, we're looking at the effect of financial transparency on hospitals' behavior, okay? So why do we look at financial transparency? We look at financial transparency because transparency in general is becoming in increasingly used policy tools, right? So you will have um, hospitals have in some states for some medical interventions, some hospitals in the US have to report the price of the medical uh, interventions that they charge, they have to report the outcome on patients, restaurants have to put a label on their, uh, on their opening window, but like, you know, their, the quality of their, um, of their um, safety ratings. Um, some facilities in the US above some, you know, emission threshold have to report their carbon and other, um, other gas, um, gas emissions. In some countries, like in the UK, for instance, firms are asked to share information about their workforce diversity. So you see you know, a massive increase in, in the use of, of more transparency to achieve some, some goals. But it's not to say that transparency is gonna necessarily have positive outcomes, right? There can be some unintended consequences and some of those consequences may be negative. So if you want to think from a policy perspective about the net effect of having more transparency in the economy, we have to be careful and also be able to quantify some potential costs and potential unexpected costs, right? And this is something that is very hard to do. So my colleagues at the university, at Boston University and uh, University of Chicago wrote a survey like eight years ago, and they pointed to the fact that because of the difficulty to observe corporate behavior on which transparency is imposed, if you go beyond, beyond financial statements, um, it's very hard to draw conclusions because you can say, okay, more transparency on dimension X, but it's very hard to relate this to actual measurable, uh, measurable um, outcomes at the, at the firm level. And here we have a nice setting where in the case of hospitals, we can observe a lot of the, a lot of the financial and a lot of the healthcare actions that hospitals are, um, are taking. So now transparency about what? So we look at transparency about liquidity. So this is mostly a finance audience, so it should not be too difficult to convince you that liquidity uh, is important, right? It provides a hedge against some income fluctuations. There's some very nice papers published in finance journals showing that, you know, firms with better liquidity better survived the global financial crisis, or more recently, better went or better navigated through the two years of uh, massive economic COVID created uncertainty, right? Um, we know also that weak liquidity can impose some negative externalities. It's something well known in the banking area. That's why the banking regulator has been promoting more transparency, including on like stress testing after the last financial crisis, to make sure that banks have the proper amount of uh, the proper amount of, uh, of resources um, in case something something bad happens, right? And there is not a lot of evidence, or actually not much evidence at all, on the real effects of liquidity transparency in non-banking sectors, right? Maybe because liquidity is not crucial in most economic industries except for banking, but I don't think this is true in the context of non-profit, right? So here we look at financial transparency in the context of non-profit organization. So I am on the finance committee of a small non-profit that has like you know, 1.5 million in, in turnover, a, an independent book publisher, and liquidity is our biggest concerns, right? Because we a fluctuation in when we're paid by Amazon, and you know we need to have enough cash on hand to be able to pay wages on a monthly basis. There are some surveys of nonprofits in the U.S. showing that liquidity is the you know primary financial concerns that most nonprofits have less than two months of cash at hand. So any uh, any large fluctuations in in cash inflows can be um, can have adverse consequences, right? And in general, nonprofit entities are a growing share of the economy in the United States. Like it's 8% of the GDP uh, most recently. And most of the health care that we receive is at non-profit hospitals, right? You know, I mean, that I live in New York. I live very close to two large hospitals, Mount Sinai and the New York Presbyterian. Both have a non-profit non status, right? So, this is an, and health care in general is an increasing, because we have an aging population. We, through science, we live longer, so we receive more 
uh, more healthcare, more healthcare services. So this is um, an increasing, increasing share of our, um, uh, of our economy. All right, so that was for the in institutional introduction. Now I need to give you a one slide accounting primer on accounting for nonprofits. So nonprofits are regulated by the FASB in the US, same as other firms, right? The FASB sets accounting standards since 1973, and you have some general standards. So for instance, for revenue, when is you know, a transaction a revenue? Well, you look at the revenue recognition standards that applies to both for-profit and non-for-profit organizations. But on top of this, you have some additional specific standards um, for non-profit. And the first and main one was issued in 1993, it's called Statement of Financial Accounting Standard number 117. And it's basically helping handle two things. So two things that are different for non-profit than for for-profit organization is one, there is no equity holders. So if you think of your, of your financial statements when you look at the 10K, like all the ones we discussed in papers today, you have on the one side asset, on the other side you have liability plus equity. So here we don't have the equity part, they are non-for-profit by, by, by definition, so we have Assets minus liabilities equal net assets. Slightly different way to, uh, to present financial statements. And another, another unique part is non-for-profit relies, relies sometimes quite intensively on donations to, find, to fund their organization. I'm sure a lot of you donate every year some, some amount of money to different non-profit organizations for causes that are dear to your heart for, for, uh, for different reasons. And this has led to Historically, in the 1993 standards, you had to present your net assets with three subcategories called temporarily restricted, permanently restricted, and unrestricted net assets. Okay? And in 2009, the FASB created a commission, because it had been like you know, 15 years uh, or more since the last uh, standard revision for their nonprofit accounting to see whether they needed to make some updates. And they realized that this Three classifications, this, you know, three parts classification of net assets was leading to, had two, um, two main problems. The first one is there was a lot of discretion and inconsistency across hospitals in define, and across non-profit organizations in general in allocating net assets between temporarily and permanently restricted. So this was kind of confusing. But the more, the more confusing part was a misunderstand, misunderstanding about what unrestricted means. And unrestricted here means unrestricted from donor's restriction. So you know you, you are a wealthy individual, um, you donate a million dollars to the New York Presbyterian because your, your kids were born at the New York Presbyterian hospitals, and you're gonna say you can only use this money for um, you know, kids' emergency or kids' uh, medical services. Right? So there's some restrictions on how you can use the how you can use the, um, um, uh, the amount of money. And what unrestricted mean, meant here is unrestricted based to donors imposed restrictions, not in general. So this led to some you know, underappreciation of the actual restrictions in firm net asset because there are other type of restrictions. And a typical other restriction, and you have like debt covenants, and you, have like, and you put some, some liquid assets in collateral for some debt, for some, uh, for some uh, Financing, uh, financing contracts, which, is, which means that the actual amount of short-term financial assets available to meet any uh, short-term demand in, 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 uh, in financing needs is lower than what was, uh, what was perceived by stakeholders, right? So this led to a change in a new standard issued in 2016, which was the first update since 1993 of the accounting standards for nonprofit organizations. We're starting in 2016, non-for-profit organizations I don't have three categories anymore. They have two categories. They have net assets without donor restrictions and net assets with donor restrictions. To make clear that the category on top without donor restrictions might still be facing other type of restrictions in how you can use the, the asset cash or the you know, short-term liquid financial, uh, financial, uh, financial assets, right? And he also introduces either and or quantitative and qualitative liquidity disclosures. So let me give you a couple of examples. So for instance, uh, Trinity Health, which is based in, incorporated in Michigan, is a nonprofit hospital that, that operates in 22 states and has 100,000 plus employees. They state, okay, of our financial assets in our, in our financial statements are not subject to donor or other contractual restrictions. Okay, so this is an example of qualitative evidence that tells you yes. So our cash is actually 
fully unrestricted. Okay? Another quantitative evidence in financial statements would be, so I tend to pick hospitals that I visited, where I visited the emergency. Uh, I lived in Michigan 10 years ago for a year, so I visited uh, Trinity Health, and I, I live in New York. I have a bad habit of falling and breaking things when I, when I do sports. So I went most recently to the New York Presbyterian Hospital. So if you look at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, so it's a very large, it's the largest hospital. They are very cash rich, so they have no liquidity problems. But if you look at their balance sheet in 2019, you see they have 359 million in cash and cash equivalents, and they have, they have, they have 10 million of short-term assets that are locked into some uh, loan agreements, so used as collaterals. They have 22 million that are locked to pay for, uh, to pay for insurance for their medical, uh, for medical um, um, professionals at the hospital. And then they have 13 point, uh, 14 million restricted based on donors, based on donors, right? So before, what you would see is the first three number pulled together, and the last one with the donor's restriction, either permanent or temporary. Now with the new split, they have to show you any, for, they have to tell you explicitly what is under, what is restricted by, do, by donors, and if there are other form of restrictions. So here you now realize that there is like $32 million of short-term financial assets that are locked based on other contractual, contractual agreements, right? So I give you some institutional details. Now let's go to the economic, uh, uh, the economic uh, framework. You know, uh, I have to look at Daniel because everyone is talking at Daniel when we talk about economic theory. Here we do have some information. We have some information frictions. Uh, so we think that this fits well a multitasking theory. So in the Holmstrom Milgram uh, 1991, you know, the general intuition is hospitals, they do two things. They have to survive financially and they have to provide care. What we think is if you're a potential or an existing patient or stakeholders, you imperfectly observe both dimensions. You have some ideas of their financial or liquidity performance from their imprecise financial statements, and you have some idea from public sources about the quality of the care that you receive. And here what we have in mind is that by making more granular, transparent disclosure on your liquidity, you improve the precision, the publicly available, the precision of the publicly available signal on the, uh, on the liquidity of the hospitals. Okay? Holding everything else constant on care, which could lead to some reallocation, some relocation between the two dimensions here, care versus financial performance, okay? So, of course, it's nice to have like a model with some information frictions. Does it, is it actually relevant to describe what is happening in the data? So we went on the FASB website, the regulators, and we read all the comment letters, and we picked some, so I, we mentioned some in the papers. Um, here, I'm gonna show you one from a nonprofit organization that helps non-for-profit entities raise capital, and you know, they say they are worried uh, that non-profit leaders, they will work towards a better liquidity position uh, to present a more favorable liquidity picture in future years, once the standard is applied, right? So this is really thinking like words forward into a reallocation from what they do to putting more effort into showing a better financial position. And this is what we have, uh, what we have in mind in the paper. Okay, I have five minutes left, so I need to go, to go quickly. Five minutes, really? Okay, six minutes. Um, all right, so we have three types of data. We have tax returns data, so the Form 990 on non-for-profit organizations. We have facility level data, so facility hospital level data, um, a little bit more granular data from the, from the healthcare cost report information system, or we see a little more information at the facility level. So some hospitals have one facility, some have multiple. And then we're using the state inpatient databases where we have data by, for patients that come, that come to the hospital in an anonymized way, so we have millions of observations. We focus on three major diseases, heart attack, heart failure, and pneumonia, because those are the three, the three um, diseases used by the federal agency to assess the quality, the quality of hospitals. Okay, so we have 2,000 uh, hospitals and roughly 3,000 uh, hospital facility in the sample overall, and uh, 3 million patient visits over the past 10 years for those three, uh, those three visits. Okay, so identification strategy. We're gonna look at like, our treated group is going to be the hospitals that have low liquidity before the change in accounting standards. Right? So those, those hospitals, well, cross-sectionally, you know, if you're in the New York Presbyterian Hospital and you have 400 million in cash, if 20 millions are locked through some collateral for, you know, through debt contractings, it's not changing the fact that you are a highly, uh, you know, you have high liquidity and high amount of cash to meet any short-term demands. But if you're, a, if you're less, if you have less cash to begin with in your balance sheet, if part of it, uh, as, a, as a function of total asset, if part of it is locked uh, through other type of, of restrictions not coming from donors, 
uh, this regulation is revealing that you are more financially constrained than we thought. And as a control group, we're going to use two things. We're going to use first um, the high liquidity non-profit hospitals, option one, and option two, we're going to look at for-profit hospitals. We cannot do low liquidity for-profit hospitals. For-profit hospitals are all falling in the high liquidity category if you look, if you look at the median split that we use for the non-profit non ones. They have slightly different, uh, slightly different um, uh, objective. Okay, so I have like three minutes. So what we find is you raise a little less debt, and we don't know if it's a supply or a demand thing, like if banks refuse to lend to you, or if you don't, if you don't demand because you know your contract terms will be less than what you would be willing to accept given your new uh, revealed liquidity position. And we ask ourselves, okay, this is, this is kind of like a first stage test where this is creating potential pressure for you to improve your liquidity position. So what we find is that non-for-profit low liquidity hospitals tend to increase their cash balance pretty significantly after the change in accounting standards. Okay? How do you increase your cash? Well, by generating more, uh, more revenue. So we find that you generate more revenue per dollar of assets, so you increase your turnover. Of course, your, your, your expenses also increase, but less so. So you generate more profit and you keep, uh, you know, this builds up your cash, your cash reserve. Importantly, we see, oops, we see no, what's happening? We see no trends in the change in operating income, so it's not a story where the low liquidity hospitals are badly performing or low quality before the standards, and hence they're mean reverting or they're taking actions for, in response to a different trend. Okay, at the facility level, we find that um, this increase in operating income that we see at the overall hospital level is coming from admitting more patients and charging 2.5, 3% more per patient visit. An average patient visit in our sample is 3.3, 3.4,000, so it's like a 70, 70, 80, 90 dollars increase in charge uh, per visit, you know, which you know, is basically what you pay at the at Mount Sinai just when you check in. So I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, pretty plausible. Okay, and finally, um, we have I think maybe our most interesting results is we can look at actual care, so actual medical treatment. So we have three million observations for those. Three different, uh, the three different high-profile uh, medical uh, medical conditions, and what is interesting is we have so many uh, so many individuals that on all the observable characteristics that we have with anonymity in the data, they are no different, right? So if you are, if you get, if you have a heart attack in a treated hospital before and after the change in standards compared to high liquidity hospitals, on average, you're the same age or the same gender, you're as likely to be of uh, certain observable characteristics, which is pretty. Uh, um, pretty nice for us. And we're going to use the same two groups of two control groups, and we have three results. The first one is we find that in terms of patient charge, we find a reallocation between Medicare and non Medicare patients. So, Medicare patients since 2009 and 10, implemented in 2010, they're before 2000, from 1983 to 2010, under Medicare, the hospital will ask to be reimbursed for the cost of treating a patient under Medicare. After 2010, you reimburse a fixed fee for a given disease, right? So for a given medical condition, they reimburse you a fixed fee that hospitals argue is well below the cost that they incur to treat you. So what we find is that at the margin, they seem to be treating fewer Medicare patients and more non-Medicare patients, especially the one with private insurance, right? And what we find is we find that non-Medicare patients tend to stay smaller amount of time, fewer number of days in the hospital, so half a day, half a day less in the hospital. In, op op in opposite, we, in contrast, we find that uh, patients under private insurance or Medicaid tend to, tend to stay longer, and they take to wait longer to receive their treatment because they are, we think that they are receiving more diagnosis. So there, there is this literature in healthcare economics that hospitals perform over diagnosis to, um, uh, to receive more money. And I'm going to hear for the very last test, and I promise you I'm closing on this, we're going to look at like, what happens when you have a heart attack. When you have a heart attack, I hope no, no one here had a heart attack, but when you arrive at the hospital, there are two options. They can do what's called an intrusive or a non-intrusive diagnosis. The non-intrusive diagnosis is they do an, an, an EKG or an echo of your, uh, of your situation. An intrusive option is the catheter, where they're going to put a tube through your leg up to your heart to see where the blockage happens. And you know, here, our patients are all the same, but what we find is that only for the non-Medicare patients, there is an increase in the diagnosis through catheter when you need, 
when you have an incentive to put more attention or more effort into your liquidity or your financial, your financial position, right? And we do find that this translates into a lower probability of receiving the actual invasive treatment, which is a, uh, you know, a punctuary uh, coronation intervention, uh, because you were presumably overdiagnosed. So this is something we took from a JPE paper in healthcare, uh, in healthcare economics, okay? Um, I have some quotes from the New York Times on like what happens to the patient under Medicare, but I don't have time for this. There's still an early paper, and at the end, what we're trying to show here is what happens when you force organizations that have two types of incentive. One is like you know being a, a bank to financially sus sustainable in the long term, at the same time providing care to patients, pet care to patients. When you put more emphasis on the financial performance, this comes through forcing more transparency to help other stakeholders. Um, you create like incentive to reduce the amount of, of care here by like charging more and treating patients differently with some reallocation. All right, I'm clearly over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our discussion is Pong Liu from MIT. Good job. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. So first, uh, thanks Faye and Laura for uh, inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. So it's very glad. I'm very glad to to, to be back. Uh, though last the, uh, edition I attended actually is online. Uh, and also, congrats, Thomas, for uh, winning the, 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 the prize. So this also makes my job particularly hard. So hopefully my comments, uh, just to, to, to provide actual thought for you uh, in the future revision of the paper. So I think Thomas uh, did a great job in uh, presenting the paper. So let me just uh, briefly recap uh, the, the, the kind of the key message of the paper. So this paper tried to study the implications or real effects uh, of information disclosure, particularly fo focus on the setting of not-for-profit hospitals by tracking the outcomes of patients in terms of uh, whether the hospitals, they are providing more expensive but maybe not necessary uh, procedures to diagnose the patients, and, and also whether the hospital charge more, uh, given the same episode of services. And why this, is, th this research question is very, very important uh, so first, the setting is more about private firms. So we know the private firms account for majority of the portion of the, 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 the aggregate economy. However, the information disclosures by private firms, m most of the times, they are typically limited and uh, voluntary. So that's why a lot of uh, scholars, they advocate for more financial disclosures uh, about the private firms. So they say uh, more disclosures actually can be good because we can reduce the agency issues among the stakeholders within the private firms. And this is a particular, uh, particularly uh, relevant for the hospital sector or healthcare sectors generally uh, because it's a mess, uh, at least based on my personal experience. So the hospital sectors or healthcare sector uh, is vital for the general or public uh, welfare. However, a lot of people complain due to the lack of transparency within the sectors. We witness a lot of issues. So here I give one example, one episode of a drama actually come from my home state, uh, Massachusetts. So there's a one hospital chain, a uh, student healthcare hospital chain. So recently they fall into the financial trap and they try to ask or request the help from the, uh, the Massachusetts state governments. And in return, uh, the, the governor, uh, Haley, uh, Haley, sorry, so she requests to say, okay, if you want me to help you, please disclose all the information, uh, financial information. So in the end, right now, I think they already passed the deadline. Uh, the, the state government gave them a deadline to release all the financial information, but they passed the deadline without uh, disclosing anything. And then the, 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 the governor say, okay, you and your team have not been forthcoming and truthful or responsive about what's happening within, uh, with your financial status, operating plans, and so on. So please leave Massachusetts. Basically, the, the, the follow-up plan is to close down the hospitals uh, freeze all the admissions of new patients and then remove all the physicians or doctors maybe to other facilities. So it's a mess. So given that, um, this paper actually tried to see, okay, whether we need to uh, do more information disclosure, financial disclosures regarding the hospital sector. So this paper used a very comprehensive data 
both at the facility levels, you can see the financial information, operational information, cost information about hospitals. At the same time, they use very amazing granular data uh, for patient visits. Basically, all the patient, inpatient visits uh, among the hospitals, basically across all the US uh, hospital systems. And the empirical design actually is quite neat. Uh, so they use a shock in 2018, sorry, 2016, from the Financial Accounting Standards Board. They try to update the accounting rules for not-for-profit entities. Basically, you need to disclose more information about your liquidity status, uh, your cash holdings, and so on. And they use a different, different very simple uh, comparisons, basically to compare the before the shock, the low liquidity hospitals versus the high liquidity hospitals before and after the shock, how they're gonna respond to this policy change. And the finding actually is sort of surprising because for a lot of financial scholars, the common sense or the common wisdom is that we need to do more uh, disclosures for, 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 for firms uh, because this can improve market efficiency and all sort of uh, positive externality here. But this paper, they say, okay, right now, if we impose more stringent liquidity disclosures, maybe we are gonna impose extra social cost. This can be bad for patients in several uh, dimensions. So first, because the, the, the more liquidity disclosures actually got, gonna exert some financial pressures on the hospitals, that's why they have the incentive to change their operations. How they're gonna do the change? They try to replenish the cash or cash holdings by increasing their revenues. So they charge more, giving the same episode of the uh, procedures, and then they try to make the, 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 the patients stay longer in the hospitals and then provide them all sorts of uh, unnecessary kind of procedures. So that's a key message of the paper. Um, so my, my main take of the paper, I think it's a very important paper, uh, address uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, policy relevant questions. So uh, we still know very little about the social impact of uh, financial disclosures and also, the paper used very uh, great measurements regarding the hospitals and the patient level. And then, as I mentioned, the uh, healthcare sector is, um, is so messy. So this somehow shed light on the regulations, or at least the information disclosure policy uh, debates right now we are facing uh, regarding the healthcare sector. So, um, sorry. So my comments uh, will be around three different fronts. Uh, it's mainly about the narrative of the current paper and also regarding the regulations, whether it's binding uh, or not, uh, given a lot of other regulations healthcare sector are facing. And the last point is more about the channels. Why the hospitals, they have incentive to change. Okay, so for the first uh, comments is about narrative. So basically the key takeaway of the paper is that disclose more liquidity status or information actually is bad because these are gonna generate some social cost. However, uh, this bad or costly is relative to what, what kind of confactuals we may have in mind. So um, imagine, let, let's just do uh, such kind of a thought experiment. Suppose, uh, imagine a world without the change in liquidation disclosures uh, requirements. So you can imagine a lot of hospitals they may have the incentive, particularly for uh, poor managed hospitals, they may have incentive to uh, misuse a lot of funds. They may, uh, they may uh, somehow, uh, uh, just, just like the episode I, I mentioned, the Stewart healthcare uh, uh, financial troubles right now in Massachusetts. So this is sort of the cause, I suppose, without the, uh, the, the, the liquidation disclosure here. And then another thing is, the li liquidity constrained hospital, why they're liquidity constrained, maybe inherently they're just worse in terms of providing worse or low quality services to patients. And like in the long run, the optimal strategy for them is just to close them down. That's in equipment the best strategies. So maybe uh, imposing more stringent liquidation uh, uh, disclosure requirements on them is a good thing for us. It can generate some social benefits. So somehow the paper right now is a little bit muted about all these other dimensions of social benefits or social cost discussions. So it might be quite helpful for the paper to provide a more balanced narratives regarding the other type of benefits or potential costs. And also 
to investigate a lot of other outcomes associated because right now you focus on three different types of uh, heart attack patients and see whether they, sh they, they are facing uh, larger bills or some other outcomes. But we can just check, for example, in terms of quality measures or mortality of the patients, these are more kind of prominent outcomes for the patients. And then the second comments I have uh, is regarding the kind of regulation environment facing the healthcare sector. So um, as uh, Francesca actually had alluded to at the very beginning, every time when we use CompuStat data, we're gonna exclude financial sectors, utility sectors, and a lot of times also healthcare sector. Why? Because they face a lot of regulations, other type of regulations. So besides the regulation, the policy change mentioned in the paper, actually the healthcare sector, they face tons of at state level regulations. So here I give one example. California actually requires the local hospitals to disclose a lot of financial information. So I, I give a, a screenshot of one medical center at a medical center in California. It's before 2016, it's uh, 2013. So this financial statement actually is over 100 tables, a lot of information. Particularly they have one table, uh, talk about the balance sheet on restricted funds. You can see the cash, uh, marketable securities, accounts, and short-term uh, uh, notes, receivables, and so on. So these are all short-term assets. At the same time, they also disclose, required by California governments, state governments, the assets whose use is limited. So I check the instruction or documentation for the California hospitals. What does it mean, this assets whose use is limited? So basically, they say, uh, either by hospitals, governing board, trust agreements, or other parties, including the donors. Actually, if any parties impose uh, some restrictions here, they will be characterized as assets whose use is limited. So then the question uh, here is, given the state level, California imposed such kind of stringent uh, disclosure requirements, what investors in the end can learn from the policy change of the financial accounting uh, standards board's policy change uh, in uh, 2016. So would that be a threat? So in my view, actually, uh, it will not be a threat, not necessarily. I think this is a great opportunity, actually, to sharpen the identification. How to do that? Basically, you can explore the state level re uh, reporting requirements heterogeneities. California is one exception, but a lot of states, actually, they do not have such kind of stringent uh, disclosure. You can use that uh, if the, 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 uh, the, um, the financial accounting standards board's policy change have a bite uh, uh, here. So you should expect that they're gonna impact states with hospitals like facing very, very kind of low requirements regarding the, the liquidity disclosures before 2016. So you can do just the triple uh, definitive. Uh, this can be more convincing evidence. And my, my last comments uh, is regarding this channels. So right now in the paper, it shows one table, table three, uh, to show that the major pressure comes from financiers because after the liquidity disclosures, the debt holders somehow are unwilling to extend debts. So in terms of magnitude, the debt, insur uh, the debt insurance by the liquidity constrained hospitals after the shock is around 0 0.5 to 0.6% of the total assets. So this magnitude somehow is kind of small uh, relative to, for example, the cash holdings they have uh, is around 3.5% on average for the treated hospitals. So sh if I'm the manager of the hospital, should I be concerned if I just face a reduction of 0.5, 0.6 reduction of debt insurance? So maybe not. So I was just thinking maybe the other type of stakeholders, they are also gonna respond to the policy change. For example, the donors or uh, the, the gift givers because uh, the pr prior literature, they show that for donors, they prefer donating their money to the financially stable institutions or hospitals because they, in the long term, they can fulfill the, their commitments. So also for the suppliers, the medical device, they may extend the, the trade credit to the hospitals. Right now, if they see, for example, the, the, you have a low liquidity, uh, low liquidity cash holdings there, so basically I'm unwilling to extend my trade credit. So that can also exert actual uh, pressures on the hospitals. And uh, some, another alternative, maybe the last 30 seconds, just talk about another alternative hypothesis, maybe the paper can rule out, because the liquidity constraint here, maybe just the signal regarding the management skills 
or uh, the weak governance of the hospitals. So now the managers, they may have incentive to signal. They just say, okay, it's not coming from the external financial pressures. It's just that I want to prove I'm a good manager of the hospitals. So I want to make some sort of change. So for that, maybe you can uh, just explore some um, uh, CEOs, hosp hospital CEOs managerial qualification uh, variations and see whether indeed the, the kind of the bad quali the quality uh, managers of CEO, they are, are responding to this policy change uh, more aggressively. Uh, that's pretty much all my... Uh, comments. I have some like minor comments to so just leave for you. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for this excellent discussion. I will, oh, I will super briefly respond to two points. Um, one is, I first I completely agree with everything you said. Um, as a French person, what is beautiful is that in my country everything is centralized. So the data either does not exist or it exists for everyone, and you have to rely on some side threshold to get some identification. The beauty of the US as a federation is that you have a lot of state variation. The drawback is that there's also inconsistency in accessing the data. And um, I completely agree we have to look at like state variation in reporting for nonprofit, especially hospitals. One challenge that we looked at this a little bit, and we, can, we could only find 14 states where the state medical board, which is the regulators, the state regulators that rules oversees the hospitals, were forcing hospitals to put their financial statements out there. Because we could even look this, we can even do what you suggested by looking at like, okay, this is the amount of information pre-accounting standards, not even bringing for each hospital's financial statements and say, okay, you're not impacted because you're already above voluntarily, either voluntarily or because of some state uh, imposed, uh, imposed restrictions. It's gonna be a little hard to do, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, so that's going to be yeah. yeah. yeah that's going to that's going to help. Um, okay, um, I agree with the governance for trying to get uh, some data. Uh, maybe I can take one question because we're out of time. I'll still take one question. No questions. So I'm out of time. All right. <laughs>